All right, this is uh, kind of the fourth session on the kingdom of God. And uh, just kind of review a little bit of what we've done in the past. You know, I talked about how the kingdom of God, the disciples, the Jews of that first century knew the general time frame when this was going to be happening because they went back to Daniel chapter 2 where King Nebuchadnezzar had the dream about the four kingdoms and it was within that fourth kingdom, which was the Roman Empire, that the kingdom of God was going to come. We talked about a stone that was placed there with not human hands. And so they had a general time frame, but what they didn't understand was that they didn't really have any understanding of what that kingdom was going to look like. In other words, they thought the kingdom was coming, the Messiah was going to set up the kingdom, kick out the Romans, and it was done. And that was it. But instead, Jesus comes and he appears totally different than anyone else thought he would. And the kingdom starts small, and he begins to give parables about how the kingdom is like a, a mustard seed. It starts very small, and then it grows, and how that happens in numerically, but also uh, in the quality within each person. So it starts silently within, so it's a kingdom that starts in the inside and goes out rather than top down. And so it was a huge paradigm shift for them. And there's so many things they had to learn, like they were always arguing with themselves, who was going to be the greatest? And Jesus said, you, you guys don't get it. That's not how this kingdom works. If you want to be great, you become the servant of all. And so they had a, a, a really hard time, and we would have done the same thing, um, because we, were, we could just use what information they had. And so it was a major paradigm shift. So we went through several of the par uh, parables last time. We talked about the last one being, it was actually a, a, a prophetic parable about what was going to happen because of the Jews' rejection of accepting Jesus as a Messiah and that destruction was going to be coming upon Jerusalem. And so, as he's teaching another parable, we're going to be going, if you open your Bibles, to Matthew chapter 18. We're going to be looking at the parable of the unforgiving servant, or the unmerciful servant, depending which version you're looking at. So, chapter 18 of Matthew, and we're going to start in... Verse 21. And it says, Then Peter came to Jesus, and he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brothers when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, within Judaism, the rabbis taught that if you forgave someone three times, that was showing a a significant uh, forgiving spirit. That was all you were really required to do. So when Peter tells the Lord, how about seven times, he really thought, you know, it's almost like he's patting himself on the back going, they say three, but I say seven. You know, and then Jesus answers back. And by the way, where they got that, as far as three times, there's a passage in Amos 1.3 and in Job 33.29, different places where they picked up this thing about being three times to forgive a brother is significant. And so Jesus answers him, and he says, up, uh, Peter says up to seven times, and Jesus answers, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Now, that's not a mathematical equation, okay? Because if you do the math, that turns out to 490 times. So it's not like you're making a mark every time you forgive your brother. Jesus would use hyperbole many times to make a point. So it wasn't about that number. It's just like when Jesus tells, tells uh, the disciples, he says, you know, if, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. 
Well, if we took that literally, probably none of you would be here because you couldn't get here, right? I mean, we would all be sitting there without hands, eyes, parts of our body, right? So he intentionally uses hyperbole many times to make a point. And so he's doing that with this 70 times 7. And then he goes on and says, Therefore, begins to tell them again another parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Now, in this parable, the story behind the story is that this king is the Lord. The servants are me and you. So he wanted to settle accounts with his servants, and he began the settlement. A man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, 10,000 talents, just to give you an idea, is in today's money would be $6 billion. Again, that was kind of hyperbole. He's just showing that it's an amount that there's no way you and I could repay it. The debt that has been forgiven each one of us in here, we have no chance of paying for that debt. That's his point. And since he was not able, let me pick it up, as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Now the servant fell on his knees before him, and he said, Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Like you're going to pay back six billion dollars. Very doubtful, right? The servant's master took pity on him, and he canceled the debt, and he let him go. So again, let's, let's put, apply this to our life. Our debt... Because there's none that are righteous. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We are all at a deficit. And yet the Lord has forgiven us of all. Some of us have maybe done more. Some of us maybe less. But we all are in great need of forgiveness. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, that would be about $12,000. That's still a significant amount, but it's nothing in comparison to what the, the $6 billion. So he grabbed him, and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Now, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me. And I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Now, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told the master everything that had happened. So then the master called the servant. And he said, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? In anger, the master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owned. Verse 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Again, that's in red letters. This is how your heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. 
Now, in this NIV uh, version in, in verse 34, it said, be turned over to the torture. Some say, versions say, turned over to the jailer. Uh, most believe that it's, it's actually turning over to tormenting demons. So, the Lord takes this thing about forgiveness very, very seriously. In fact, if we go back to Matthew chapter 6, which is the Lord's prayer. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 9. And he's teaching, the disciples ask him, you know, teach us to pray. And in verse 9 he says, then this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we, for, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Verse 14. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 15, but if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. It's pretty plain, and some of us may think almost hard, but it's a fact. If you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. The Lord takes forgiveness very seriously. I'm just going to read you another verse out of Ephesians chapter 4. This is Paul. And he says, Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Mark 11:25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. So we have this same theme going over and over. If you want to be forgiven from the Heavenly Father, we must forgive. We can't harbor unforgiveness. There was a book I read. Oh, it's been probably three or four years ago. Uh, it was from a lady. I knew who she was. I didn't really know her, but I knew her husband because I was on a trip uh, after the earthquake in Haiti with him. And it was a book I really didn't like reading. It was very kind of hard. She was a, a strong Christian woman. One day, she was in a worship service, worshiping, and the Lord took her to hell. And so she wrote this book about her experience. And she described, and I can't remember all the details. I need to get it, uh, reborrow it back. Actually, it's the slushers who lend it to me. But she had an experience, and it went on for quite some time, that she was in a place of, of torment. But the bottom line is why it was, and why she had went through that, was because she had harbored unforgiveness in her heart. Something had happened to her in the past, and it, and it was very tragic. It, it was trauma, but she had refused to forgive the person for what they did. And as a result of that, after she went through this experience, that's what the whole book was about. It was about she was undone, and she ended up having, to, of course, repent of the bitterness, the things she held against this person. And it had nothing to do, what that person did was completely wrong. I mean, it was bad. But in those cases, it, it really not about the other person, it's about you. It's about you. Because the question is, isn't, will you be offended? The question is, what will you, will you do with the offense? You will, will be offended. 
you will be hurt. Someone is going to offend you. Someone is going to treat you wrong. That's called life. It's going to happen. The issue is, what will you do with that? I had a, uh, a leader once talk to me, and, and he said, unless you have been stabbed in the back, betrayed, you're not fit for leadership in the kingdom. Unless you've been through that and come out the other side. So offense in the body of Christ is a huge deal. Unforgiveness is not a minor thing. It is a huge thing. Now, unforgiveness produces bitterness, which can produce sickness and disease within your body. So we could come up and we could pray for you, lay hands on you, put oil on you. But until you deal with a root cause, and if it's unforgiveness, it won't do any good. So it is critically important that we search ourselves if there is anything that we have against anyone. In fact, again, in that Mark 25, he said, When you are stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Another thing to remember is if you do not forgive, the offender still has power over you. You may not realize that, but that's true. You're not free. You probably may have heard this before, but it says unforgiveness is like mixing poison to give to the one who has offended you, but instead you are the one who are drinking it. You're not hurting that person. You're only hurting yourself by harboring that bitterness, by harboring unforgiveness. And bitterness is really nothing more than unfulfilled revenge. Think about that. Nothing more than unfulfilled revenge. You wanted to get back at that person. They need to pay for what they did. Another area of offense, because many times we talk about people, because like say, you hang around enough, you're going to get offended. But some people have offense against God. Now, they usually don't verbalize that. And it's usually because of maybe a false expectation they had that God was going to do this. It didn't happen. Or maybe because God allowed this to happen. And so there is actually an offense against God. But anytime there's an offense against God, I think you can probably figure this out. It's not his problem. It's our problem. All right? Because God's preparing us for eternity. We usually only see the present. What's going on now? What's in our life? But God allows things to come into our lives, sometimes negative things that he will even cause and other times that he will allow to come into your life that to us seem very negative, but very needful for us. You notice that in the scripture out of Romans, what is it, 8.28, all things work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So our viewpoint is very short. You know, we're looking at the present What's going on in our lives and why did this happen? The Lord's looking at eternity. He's preparing us for something. You know, preparing to reign and to rule. And that's where trust comes in. 
Because when those things happen, your trust is going to be tested. Do you really trust the Lord? Well, why did, why did you allow this to happen, Lord? And whether we know it or not, we can build up a wall of separation between us and the Lord. Bitterness can be, become part of our life. And it's not pleasant being around a bitter person, right? Now, some comments that I've heard over the years was, I can't forgive. You don't know what they did to me. What they did to you, it's, it's not a question about whether it was right or wrong. Obviously, whatever it was, it was wrong. And if it's something that was against the law of the state or the law of the federal government, then they need to be punished, right? But when you say, I can't forgive because how they have hurt me, you're hurting yourself. And until you get free from that, and until you can let it go, it's going to be, a, it's going to be like a cancer inside of you. Always hindering you from going forward. Another one. Is it, I can't, if you can't say, you know, if they say, I can't, I just can't do it. I don't, I tried, I, I can't do it. And in your own power, that's probably true. But by the grace and the forgiveness that God has shown you, you can. I mean, there's a lot of bad things that have happened to a lot of people. Things that should never have happened. But again, we, we must remember, we're not responsible for that other person. We're responsible for us. And so that's why we have to deal with those issues inside of us and deal with it. Regardless of whether that other person even recognizes that they did anything wrong. You know, reconciliation of the relationship would be a goal. But it's not always possible. In other words, you can forgive that person. You may, you may never be their friend again like you were before. You may not have the same relationship. But you can still forgive them. Because Romans twelve eighteen says, As far as it depends on you. Live at peace with everyone. As it depends on you. Again, you can't control the other person. But you do have a responsibility to let go of the unforgiveness. What forgiveness does, it enables you to move on with your life. Instead of keeping some area kind of on hold, this kind of nagging thing within you that will hinder you and will hinder a church from moving far further and, and on because of that unforgiveness. So it's something that has to be dealt with. You know, look at some of our Examples we have in the Bible. Of course, Jesus. We think of Jesus. Here he was. He's on the cross. He's been beaten beyond reckon. You know, they couldn't even recognize his face. Spit on, cursed on, hand, you know, nails driven in his hands and in his feet, hanging on the cross in an, in an awful death. And what's his, some of his last words were, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It's pretty extreme. Think of that. Laughing at him, suffering, and yet his last words, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
I think of Joseph, betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, went through hell, really, for a lot of years, and then the Lord raises him up, so he becomes the second powerful man in the most powerful country of the world at that time. And then he has his opportunities when his brothers come back before him, not knowing who he is. And he had the opportunity to take revenge. And instead, what did he say? You met it for evil, but God met it for good. Or Stephen, the first martyr of the church. So as he's being stoned, and he says, you know, Lord, receive my spirit. Do not hold this sin against them. So as someone is killing you, do you have that? I mean, that's, that's extreme forgiveness. And again, I want to read Matthew eighteen fifteen Because it's, it's, it's really a warning. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Again, that's in the red letters. Colossians 3.13 Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you have against each other. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So when we forgive, we're not forgiving because they earned it. We're doing it because it's a command of the Lord. And we're doing it because it's self-destructive. If we hold on to unforgiveness, if we hold on to bitterness, we are, it's us that's suffering. It's not the other person. And again, you will be offended. Someone's going to offend you. Someone's going to probably betray you. Someone's going to stick a knife in your back. And yet, we are told by the Lord to forgive. And so I want each of us to take some time and just begin to do a little self-evaluation. Let's go back in our lives in our times, and let's begin to begin to think, is there anyone that you have not forgiven? And again, when I say we forgive them, that does not mean what they did was right. It it means that's between them and the Lord. That's their problem. Our problem is is to forgive and not hold that bitterness within us. So take a few minutes and let's begin to just go through your life because sometimes there there are things that are not on the surface that we don't recognize. That, hey, I forgot about that. You haven't really forgot. It's there. And it's holding you back from the fullness and the freedom that the Lord wants us to have. So let's just be, present ourselves before the Lord. Go ahead and just close your eyes and, and just open your heart. Ask the Lord, Lord, is there anything, is there anyone, is there any situation, Lord, that, that I need to repent of? Is there any person that I need to release, that I need to forgive so that I can move on? So, Lord, I just ask right now, Lord, that as we search our hearts, Lord, that you would bring to our minds anyone who has offended us, anyone who has caused a wall to come up in our relationship with either with individuals or with you. 
Lord, if we have an offense against you, when you didn't answer the prayer that we thought you should have, Lord, we repent. So, Lord, I ask right now, Lord, do a deep work. It says the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to come now and lead us into all truth. If there is anything in our life, Lord, any unforgiveness, Lord, we are so grateful that you have forgiven us of our mighty trespasses. Lord, that we were without hope, that we were like that man who owed the $6 billion. We had no way to make it right. The only thing we deserved was hell. But Lord, you had mercy upon us. You granted us forgiveness. You granted us to be new creations in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we don't want to have anything within us that causes bitterness to grow in our hearts, Lord. So I ask right now, Lord, that you would begin to root out any root of bitterness, that it would be pulled out by the roots, that we would be a people who are truly free, free from unforgiveness, having a a forgiving heart, Knowing that in this life, we will have tribulations. In this life, we will be offended. But Lord, you have given us the answer. How to do that. How to be free. So that that person or that, that circumstance would have no power over us. That we would truly be free. For there is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So I ask for this people right now, Lord, for freedom. From everything that has happened in the past, for that to be cut off in Jesus' name. That we as a people might go forward in you. So Lord, we ask that you would come. Come, search us, Lord. As David cried out, search us, see if there's anything within us. So I ask you begin to search us, Lord. That as we wait upon you, Lord, show us, Lord, if there's anyone we need to forgive. Cleanse us, Lord. Cleanse us. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Do a work. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome your dealings. Lead us into all truth.